but I'm crying. <laughs> um, hey, everybody. My name is Roby, Roby S, because we're being recorded, and um, and I know the traditions, and I am an alcoholic. Oh man, so I called Kevin at. I'm in New Jersey, so I'm on the East Coast time. So I called Kevin at 7.46 and I said, I'll be there two minutes before eight. And he said, I knew you'd be running late. And I really was trying not to run late, but I had hurt my back and my chiropractor said that he could see me at the last minute. So I went there. So I'm very grateful. And I'm really grateful for preambles and all of these other things that, that get us started. I tried to look at who all the people are to see if like who I know and who I don't. So I just want to say, if I know you and I owe you a phone call, I'm sorry. <laughs> and um, call me or text me. And I just, I want to say that whatever forum I get the opportunity to be in a room full of alcoholics who are attempting to, you know, live on the other side of active alcoholism. It's like the most wonderful part of my day, my moment, my year, my life it is just, it fills me up with, with such immense joy. I was gonna say gratitude, but the word is joy. And for a person who's, um, was pretty depressed most of their life and anxious and felt like, like that was the way, like, like if I had something bad to talk about, it would be really, you know, people would like be interested in me to, to sit here and just say that, that my life is pure joy is nothing short of a miracle. You know, I heard for years in Alcoholics Anonymous, this thing, they say things in Alcoholics Anonymous. If you're new, this is your first meeting. If you're in your first 90 days, if you're in your first 10 years, if you're in your first 30 years, just stay, you know, wherever you're at in the journey, just stay. And this thing that I heard was don't give up five minutes before the miracle happened. And I've come to experience that my life is always five minutes before the miracle happens. So my sobriety date is January 1st, 1986. Um, that was before cell phones. That was when I was, I got sober in New York City. That was, um, I want to say quarters, but it could have been dimes. People could have been dimes. Not sure. You can Google it. But I, I was an, an alcoholic of the hopeless variety, like most of us who get here and stay here. And when I was struck sober by a force that was greater than anything I could have ever imagined, I couldn't walk down the street. And so I would like get down a street. If anyone knows New York City, like the, the long grid and the short grid. So I would go down the short grid, right? So I would go like from, you know, 36 to 37th, like in between. And there would be a payphone on every corner and I would have to call somebody because I would pass these stores that had these bottles of alcohol and they were really like, they, they, they talked to me, you know, they talked to me and I just heard my accent. Oh my God. I moved back to New Jersey after 32 years, two and a half years ago. You wouldn't have ever thought I left. They just came back <laughs> big time. Um, but I would, uh, I would walk down the street and I would have to call somebody on every street corner. And this was, this was a different time. And I want to tell you something. I don't remember a time that somebody didn't pick up the phone. I don't remember. And I've, I've, I have a lot in my life today. I have a lot of people. I have a lot of communities. I have a lot of support. I have so many things, but there is nothing to me like the immense generosity that I have found that has been given to me by the people in Alcoholics Anonymous and that I get to practice giving on a daily basis. So um, 
37 plus years is a long time to be doing this. And I really want to talk to you about what happened on the other side. But before I talk to you about what happened on the other side, I'm going to tell you hopefully in five minutes or less, what even got me here at the age of 21 years old. Um, I was, I was 21. I was a senior at Rutgers University. And I never say the name of the college that I went to. I always go as a senior at this like prestigious university in New Jersey. And then you all are thinking Princeton and I'm thinking, God, yeah, it's Rutgers, but still. Um, and, and I, I can say, and I could say that for a bunch of reasons, not the least of which is I think one of my nieces is going to Princeton in two years. So that should be really cool. She's amazing. And I am very proud, Andy. Um, but on Easter Sunday, I'm Jewish. So on Easter Sunday, I belong to a group here. I joined a group, took me like a long time after moving and the pandemic, but I joined a group that goes on commitments. So Easter Sunday, I'm thinking the Jew, I should go. I should go on the commitment Easter Sunday morning, right? Nice thing to do. So I went on the commitment and I'm speaking. And for some reason at that commitment, I said that I went to Rutgers University and this man comes up to me. I want to say this guy, but like, we're all like well past the age of like where we're guys, right? So this man came, comes up to me and he said, did you go to the Rutgers Young People meeting in 1985 and 1986? And I was like, yeah, we all did. Everyone went to that meeting. And he said, my wife and I went. He said, my wife is, is I'm Jim. My wife is Meg. And I like twirled and I went, I said something that I'm not going to say because I'm being recorded and Kevin knows I am not shy about like using whatever words I need to use. And I said, Jim, and I'm telling you, I know this is being recorded, but you guys all, you never can call me this. I said, Jim, it's Roberta because Roby's short for Roberta. God help me. I said, I said, it's Roberta. Meg was my first sponsor. His wife was my first sponsor. And I hadn't seen her in 34 years since I had left New Jersey and I've moved like all over the world and we're getting together in um, a couple of weeks for coffee. And I thought, how cool is that? How cool is that? You know, and I was 21 years old and I just, I, I mean, maybe she was 23 or 24. She's just a few years older than me. And I just, I just thought she was just like the most, like she was like an angel in my life. And she's just the most wonderful person that ever existed. And I'm so grateful I get the chance to see her anyway. Um, but before I went to the Young People's Meeting in New Brunswick, you know, and before, I got there. I fell into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous by accident because I didn't believe I was an alcoholic. In fact, the thought never crossed my mind. It never crossed my mind. So if you're here and your story isn't like anyone else's, that's okay. Your story is your story. What got you here got you here. I, um, my first addiction goes way back because when I roll it back from the alcohol, from the sex, from the drugs, from the food, from the bulimia, my first addiction was fantasy because I wanted to be anyone other than me. I wanted to be someone else, somewhere else doing something else every minute of every day because being me was so unbearable. I remember thinking that when I was four or five years old. When I was 12 years old, I got this book called Notes to Myself, My Struggle to Become a Person. Seriously, I was 12 years old. And I was reading a book called Notes to Myself, My Struggle to Become a Person, which I still have because I unpacked books when I moved from California to New Jersey and I found it and it's up on my shelf and I see it and it's all like, like yellow and everything. And I don't remember a lot of the book and I haven't opened it even though I unpacked it like a year ago, but there was a line in the book and the book said, if I show in the line said, if I show you who I am, you might not like who I am. And that's all I have to give. And that was it. I couldn't let anyone know who I was because it was, I was so afraid. I was so afraid that they wouldn't like me, that I wouldn't be enough, that I wouldn't be who they wanted or what they thought. And when I took my first alcoholic drink at the age of 12, I was drinking from a very young age. I come from an Orthodox Jewish family. We're like the Catholics just the other side, right? Like we're all the same. You know, there's wine every Friday night. Let's start with that. There are two holidays that we call the alcoholic holidays because what they want you to do on those alcoholic holidays is get drunk, you know? And so like I was drinking at a really young age and um, I took my first alcoholic drink when I was 12 and I didn't take it because I wanted to get drunk. I just take it because I, I like, I just needed to relax because it was just too stressful. It was just too stressful. And I wanted to throw up. 
So if anyone has other parts of their story besides alcohol, you can still be here because I'm still here because the 12 steps as they're laid out in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous continues to save my life. And I have other addictions and I have other issues. And one of those issues is that I was, was bulimic and I would drink three times a day, just a little bit, just to chill, just to relax. And then when I drank a little bit more, I could throw up without it being too violent and too painful. So at the age of 12, I started to drink three times a day, just a little bit, just a little bit to help take the edge off. Of course, the little bit quickly got to be a lot. There's a line in the big book. I think it's, um, I don't know what page it's on. Um, so I'm not gonna pretend to know because sometimes I do know, but this one, I don't know, but it's a line that says, we were seldom mildly intoxicated. We were always insanely drunk, but that's not my story. My story is that I was always mildly intoxicated. I spent the better part of nine and a half years being mildly intoxicated. I was young, waiting for the moments that I could be insanely drunk. And the older I got and the smarter I got and the more manipulative I got and the easier it got to figure it all out, the more I could have those moments where I could be insanely drunk. And I'm also a people pleaser. So I didn't want to like upset anybody. So I also made sure like I did really good in school and I'm also a goody two shoes. Like I was terrified to get in trouble. Like it really was really stressful and really exhausting to try and keep up with all the different parts of my life that like I had going on. It was really, really hard. And the more stressful it got and the harder it got, the more I had to drink a little bit more than three times a day. To this day, I still do not understand how my parents didn't know. Now, just a little sidebar about that. My mother will have 24 years on the 3rd of June. Absolute freaking miracle. My mother, I'm 58 years old. I know you all thought that I got sober when I was two, um, but I'm 58 and actually will be 59 in a month. And my mom got came into the rooms when she was the age I am today. Like, is that crazy? I think about that. Her mother died when she was the age. I am today. That's what got my mother into the rooms. You know, my grandmother, who um, her mother, who was absolutely amazing, had a lot of health-related problems due to addiction. You know, and um, you know, and I come from a nice Jewish family. We're immigrants. I'm first-generation American from Brooklyn, New York. Nice Jewish girls aren't alcoholics and addicts. Wrong. We are. This disease has absolutely no prejudice. So, um, you know, I, I did everything. I did well in school. I got into a good school. I drank, I hit it. I, um, I, I engaged in risky behavior from a very young age. I don't know if engaging in risky behavior makes you an alcoholic, but in order for me to engage in the risky behavior, I had to drink. Like for me, it was just all attached. I remember... I wrote, um, I call it the mother of all fourth steps. I worked the steps as laid out in a big book using a method called the Hyannis Big Book Step Study Method. I was introduced to that in my seventh year of sobriety. And I believe if I wasn't, I would have drank and I believe I would have died. And when I got to the sex part of it, you had to write like all the names of all the people that you had had sex or flirtations. I mean, it was really long. It was like three big five subject notebooks. And one of the people, I didn't remember a lot of names, but there was this guy on the list when I was 15. And I just wrote guy at Passover Seder because my grandmother had passed away when I was eight and we would go away for Passover. And I was really bored. My family was really like, like they were just, I wasn't interested. And there was another guy who was with his family and he was really bored. <laughs> I guess he wasn't interested. And we went outside and we found some things that we were interested in. And, um, one of the things, one of the questions on that part that I got to, and I wrote this when I was 28 years old, it was 13 years later, was what should you have done instead? And because God was guiding my pen, the words that came out were, I should have spent time with my family. Like, wow, really? Yeah. And I think about that, you know, but that was, that was who I was. I didn't care about anyone. I didn't care about anything. I didn't care about how you feel. And I fast forward to my day today. I woke up at seven o'clock on a Saturday morning. I am not a morning person. Do not talk to me till I've had two cups of really wicked strong ca caffeine. Black, thank you. 
very strong. That's it. Then you can consider talking to me. And I have some sponsees on this call and they've talked to me before caffeine. It's not that I'm mean or bitchy. I'm not. I just can't put a sentence together. I'm just not good. And um, I woke up at seven o'clock this morning and I went to this fur baby rescue, AE, CATs and DOGs. I don't like to use those names because I, I they're like people to me because um, I volunteer. So I volunteer at the rescue. And I came home and my back hurt, so I laid down. And then I have a sponsee who was in rehab, who came back, who has less than 90 days, who came over my house and we went over Bill's story. And then I drove her back to where she's staying. And then I passed the fur baby rescue. And since the chiropractor couldn't see me until later than what I thought, I thought I should go back and check on the, the kitties because there was no one signed up for the afternoon shift. And I didn't want them to have to be alone and not have fresh food and water and clean the litter. So I went in and I took care of them. That might not mean anything to any of you, but let me tell you something. The fact that I can even think about other beings and I happen to like animals um, more than I like people, even though I, and I like people a lot. So that's saying a lot, but you know, the fact that, that like that was what I thought about today. And I'm not telling you that because I want you to think I'm great. I'm telling you that because I want you to think that whatever, however you, however you define the entity that we affectionately call God in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, that's what's great. Because you see, I don't believe that somebody should want what I have. I should believe, I believe that somebody should want what, what they're supposed to have. And I don't believe if I can do it, you can do it too, because I can't do anything. I believe if there is a God, if there is a spirit of the universe, if there is a divine being that can take a person who didn't give a damn about anybody, who at the end of her drinking was going home with people she didn't know on subways in New York City, whose way of trying to pay for taxis and actually not trying to pay for taxis was giving the taxi driver sexual favors. This was the early 80s. You can't do this anymore. Things changed, but in the 80s, you could do this. And I did, you know, if there is a God who can change that person into a person who goes to her mother's house and takes out the garbage just because I love her and it's hard for her. Anything is possible, guys. Anything is possible. And if you think that's why I came in here, that's not. I came in here because I just, I needed to breathe and it wasn't working anymore. And I stopped doing drugs pretty quickly. And I stopped binging and purging pretty quickly. And I couldn't stop drinking. And that was the moment that it was kind of like, there's a line in the book that says it was a crushing blow. I couldn't stop. And then I knew, I knew. And I went, and this is how I really know I'm an alcoholic, um, 1985. So I'm playing around. My first meeting was September 5th, 1985. And I'm playing around with Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm very busy. I'm very important. I work at a restaurant in New York City. I'm going to this college in New, in New Jersey. I'm dancing. I want to tell you I was a stripper. They called me Raven. You already know they called me Roberta. I was a ballerina. I was dancing in New York City with one of the ballet companies. You know, I was doing that deal. and um. And I went to uh, Boston to visit a friend of mine for New Year's Eve. And I remember saying to her, Karen, I'm not going to drink on January 1st. So I'm going to stop drinking at 1145. I'm not going to drink on January 1st. I didn't give a damn about January 2nd or 3rd. I just didn't want to drink on January 1st. I don't believe in New Year's resolutions. I don't believe in goals. I believe in, in, in making commitments that lead to actions, all that stuff. It's a play on words, but it works for me. So I said, I'm not going to drink. So at 11.45, I stopped drinking. I went to a meeting the next day in Watertown, Massachusetts, which years later, when I moved to Massachusetts, became one of my home groups, which is very interesting. So I went to this meeting and, um, and that was it. I call it the Big Bang Theory. I like that show too. So, you know, but I call it the Big Bang Theory, the Big Bang. Why is that the Big Bang? Because every single person here who has the sobriety date has experienced the Big Bang. And this is what the Big Bang is. One day I'm drinking and I can't stop. And then the next day I'm not drinking and I never drink again for the rest of my life. Like what else is that? Boom. But that's what that is. 
it was the big bang. And I was like, wow. And I didn't know that that's what had happened. But now looking back 37 plus years later, you want to know why I know I'm an alcoholic? Because if you had told me that was the last drink, I would have drank till 1159 and I would have drank more. And only an alcoholic who was sick to the nth degree thinks that I would have had more. I lost 14 minutes. Now, I don't really obsess about it, but those thoughts have crossed my mind like, damn, damn, what was I thinking, you know? And what was the difference between December 31st, 1985 and January 1st, 1986? I didn't get a sponsor. People smoked at meetings. It was really great. There was a smoking site and a non-smoking site. So when I stopped smoking in 1987, I was still smoking. It was great. You still were smoking. You just weren't, you weren't having the enjoying part of it, right? I wasn't cleaning ashtrays. I was not drinking that coffee because I was a snob and that coffee was crap, right? Like I was, you know, I didn't want to talk to you. I remember being in a meeting. I think I was in my second year and I was having a bad day and I was the coffee person. It was a Friday night. I was living in New Jersey. It was before Kevin, not this Kevin, but my first husband, Kevin, um, and I had moved from New Jersey to Boston and this woman was helping me with the coffee and I was really having a bad day. I was having cramps. I was having a bad day. I was like, what, 23 years old or something. And she said, I'm taking this acupuncture, acupuncture quest. Can I work on your feet? And I'm like, yeah, sure. And she really made me feel better. And she was really nice. And I remember thinking, why is she being so nice to me? Cause I really wanted to be mean to her for absolutely no reason. I just wanted to be mean to her. And you know why she was being nice? Because she was God. Now, what does that mean that she was God? That means that God was, God put on her heart to love me at that moment. That's why. I don't think she was God. I wasn't praying to her, but, but God to me comes in human form. I've had so many gods in my life. I sponsor about 35 of them today. They think I'm helping them. Yeah, no, not even close, not even close. And um, I remember that. I remember that. It was 1988. If I had stayed married to my first husband yesterday it would have been 33 years. I remember that too. He's my best friend today. He called me up a few years ago. It was before the pandemic. He sent me a picture of us from our wedding. I was like, I was so young and cute and pretty and thin. I thought I was old and fat and ugly at like 25. And um, he sent me this photo. And then he said, that was one of the best days of my life. I said, seriously? He said, I didn't say the marriage. He said, just the wedding day. I was like, thanks, sweetie. <laughs> thanks. But he really is. He's one of my best friends. And I, I didn't think that when we were having troubles in our marriage or when we got divorced, that he would turn out to be like one of the lights of my life. Yeah, you live life forward and you understand it backward. I've come to learn that. Anyway, um, so I got sober going to 90 meetings in 90 days, which for me translated to three meetings a day for five years because I didn't know who I was and I was anxious and scared and awkward and uncomfortable. And I also had this degree in theater and dance. So I knew how to like make that go away and make you think that I was who whatever. And um, now today it's just real. It's just really who I am. And a little bit like I can, you know, do that thing, but I can't really fake it so much anymore because I wear my heart on my sleeve. But, um, you know, the place that I felt the most comfortable was being in an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting and saying who my name was. And, and then saying something because I didn't really care about you. I only cared about me. And I just wanted to say my day count or like what was going on in my life or whatever. And um, in the time I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, it was kind of like the, the big boom of the rehab, of the rehab um, era, I guess is the word I'm, I'm looking for. It was the rehab era. And I remember being really resentful because of people who got to go to the, wait for it, the rehab vacation, because I never did. And I came to Alcoholics Anonymous and I was working and I was in school and I was shaking and I was going to therapy and I was like doing that stuff. And I, I just didn't, I was really angry and, um, and I didn't want to be angry. So I just would pretend I wasn't. And then it would just come out sideways. And I really did whatever people told me to do. So, um, 
I was told to work the steps in certain ways. I did Hazelton books. I did worksheets. I answered questions in the 12 and 12. I'm smart. I'm not saying that because of anything great. I can memorize a few phrases, throw them back to you. It was awesome. It was awesome. I could do that and it was great. And I got to a place and then we moved to Boston where I went to graduate school. And um, we, lived, we lived outside of Boston in a place called Brookline. Then we lived in Brighton. And then um, I went to graduate school in Cambridge, Massachusetts and I got a couple of degrees. And I was going to, for anyone who knows me, I found this piece of paper in one of my books when I was moving two and a half years ago. It was a phone list for this meeting that I belonged to and I was the treasurer and it was a 7 a.m. meeting. And that was my home group. I'm telling you people, because I didn't sleep in my twenties, my thirties or my forties. I didn't sleep until I was like probably um, early fifties, probably. Yeah, something like that. I just, I want to find something. Um, but anyway, so we moved to Boston and I was in school and my husband was working and we were this thing that they called Dinks, double income, no kids. And it was the, it was the early eight, the late eighties and the early nineties. And I was Miss AA and then everything fell. And I was almost seven years sober and, um, I wanted to drink. I wanted to drink and I wanted to die. Probably over the summer, I met this woman. I sponsored her for like 10 minutes, but I met this woman and she was, she's literally like 18 days older than me. And she had gotten sober in January of 1986. And she heard me speak in a meeting and she said, she called me up and like, I literally sponsored her for like three months or something. And um, she said that what happened was that she had seven years of sobriety. She got sober literally like three days within the, my sobriety date. And she, um, and she basically said that at seven years, she drank. And I felt like she was telling my story that would have happened if I hadn't gone to a big book step study meeting on somewhere around September 5th, 1992, somewhere around seven years to the day of my first meeting, God put me, I don't know how God does this. I don't know how God, God orchestrates the perfect moments, the perfect time, the perfect people, the perfect everything at the perfect moment. Again, life is lived forward and, and understood backwards. And I walked into this meeting and this man who became somebody that became a dear friend of mine who I admired, his name was Jack the Marine. That's what we called him in Boston. He was talking about um, making amends to your mother. And my mother didn't know where I lived because in 1988, I left New Jersey and I left without a forwarding address because I couldn't handle them. Now, whether that was a good idea or a bad idea, it's what I did. It was bad advice. And because of that, I will tell you, I never give advice. I never tell anybody what to do. It ended up being okay for me. It ended up working out. It ended up having a happy ending, but it, it couldn't, it, it might not have, um, because in 1988, there was no Google, there was no cell phone, there was no internet, and nobody could find me. My, my mother knew I lived in Boston. And in all fairness, my aunt knew where I was, and I did talk to her. So it wasn't like total disappearance. Like there was a little bit of like, like a dotted line. The line back was really hard. The line back was really hard. So I moved. So I'm in my seventh year. I kicked my husband out of the house. I was um, in my last year of graduate school. and. I was working and I wanted to die. I wanted to die. And I remember calling somebody up and people call me up. People call me up and say stuff like that to me today. And I'm really grateful that I know what it feels like because I know what to say, you know, because it's not that I wanted to die. I just didn't want to feel it was just too hard. I was just too anxious. And I was so close to where I was when I had picked up the first drink at 12 years old and I had been in Alcoholics Anonymous, but I was dying and Alcoholics Anonymous. I want to tell you that was my last emotional bottom, but it wasn't. But what I will tell you is that after I went to that meeting and got a sponsor and literally did every single thing that woman told me and worked the steps exactly as they're laid out, read everything, wrote every single name from the very beginning of my life, wrote every resentment, wrote for every single resentment that affected security, self-esteem, personal, sex relations, ambition, pride, ego, money, fear, 
went back and answered selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, and afraid. Didn't check it off, answered selfish. What do I want? Dishonest, what's the lie? Self-seeking, what did I do? What was my part? Fear, what was my fear? And then I went back and answered questions about the fear. Why do I have this fear? How does self-reliance fail me? What did it make me do? What should I do instead? God, please remove my fear of not being loved, like good enough, understood of blah, 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 blah. So many fears. And direct your attention to, and this shocked me because I had never seen this in the big book and it's there. So what you would have me be. I always thought it was what you would have me do, be. Years later, I read another book and there's a line that says, be still, be still. Be still and know that I am God. That's part of my spirituality, but just be still. So hard to do. So profound, so simple. I just read with my sponsee Bill's story, simple, but not easy. Be still. Wow. You know, that's why I stopped drinking coffee after the second cup, by the way, you know, and then the sex part, you know. Nobody can be the arbiter of anybody's sex behavior. That means nobody can like judge you. That doesn't mean that I get to do things that hurt other people and get away with it. It does mean that I can have a sex ideal and identity that makes sense to me. Mine is not so out there actually, but it would be fun if it was and I tried to explore it. And then I found out that that's not who I am, you know? I've been married and divorced three times, not to the same person. I use sex as a way to be loved, even post writing that fourth step, even in my 50s. You know, when I was 49 years old and the 40 something year old cop wanted to go out with me and I knew what he was doing and I knew he wasn't, I knew what was going on and I didn't care because I just wanted to pretend for two hours when he was holding me, that he was going to love me and take care of me because that's what I've looked for my whole life. And I don't know if it was because of the stuff that happened to me or not. I don't know. I have people who I talk to who say the things that happened to you as a child determine what you do as an adult. But I know people who had things that same things happened to me and they went on to like start like fundraisers for children, like dying all over the world. And I went on to be an alcoholic and hurt people, you know? until I didn't. So it doesn't matter. Yeah, stuff happened to me. And I will say this about the sex part of the fourth step, and then I'm going to go on, that the people who I was sexually abused as a child, I was raped as a teenager, those names were not on that list because that wasn't sex. And I recently heard somebody share that they put those names on, and I'm glad that that worked for them, but I'm really against that because for me, rape and abuse are not sex. Two totally different things. But I will tell you what did happen for me because they did end up on my resentment list. I had to forgive them and I had to stop using those experiences as the reasons why I was having problems in all of the relationships I was in. Because I was there, you know? I called up Kevin this morning. I had a revelation. It was like, he texted me early, so I called him up. I said, Kevin, I had a revelation about the fifth step. Now, granted, I did the mother of all fifth steps 30 years ago. I've done some smaller inventories over the years, and I've heard a ton of fifth steps. But the reason why I had this revelation is because I sent somebody a text, and it was a little bit of a long text, and I was, I was a little bit vulnerable in the text. And I found myself thinking, oh, my God, maybe I shouldn't have sent that text. Maybe I shouldn't have said that. Maybe I shouldn't have said that. I'm 58 years old, almost 59, and I'm 16, right? Um, and so I'm like obsessing about this for a minute. And, and yes, it was a guy. And I haven't talked to guys in like years. Like, like it's been like three, three and a half years since I've like, like talked to a man, like talked to a man, like you never talked to a man, you know, not like talk to somebody. And all of a sudden I was like, whoa, 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 where's God, right? Where's God? You know, there's the bedevilments, the bedevilments on page 52 that they, it talks about, you know, my sponsor at the time that I did the steps, she had me read them with the word sober, but now I read them like this. It says, we're having trouble with personal relationships. She had me put the word sober, but now I do this. We're having trouble with personal relationships without God. We can control our emotional natures without God. We were prey to misery and depression without God. We couldn't make a living without God. We had a feeling of uselessness without God. We were full of fear without God. 
we were unhappy without God. We couldn't seem to be real help to other people without God. However you define that entity to be, I know exactly what it means to me today. I didn't for a long time sober in Alcoholics Anonymous. My early sobriety was the better part of 30 years. And I am not even remotely exaggerating, you know? And so I call up Kevin and I'm like, I got it. I don't have to like do this. I don't have to not send a text like this or send a text. <laughs> like I said this to him this morning. I'm like, I could just, I could just be who I am and it's okay. And they could be who they are. And then God will deal with it. <laughs> I only had had half a cup of coffee at that point. And it made a lot more sense when, when I was talking to him and, um, you know, we're also on the verge of like pretty much starting like another fifth, uh, starting his fifth step. So, but it was just that when I realized that I am absolutely wonderfully, fearfully, and perfectly made with all of my imperfections, I don't have to try and be anyone else to make anyone else happy, including me. I just have to be who I'm meant to be. God remove my fear. God remove my anxiety. God remove my confusion. God remove my discontent. God remove my sadness and direct your attention to what and who you would have me be. This is why I'm still an Alcoholics Anonymous because I still need to learn all this and do all this. And the way I learn on this and do all this is by the, the 30 or 35 or 40 people who call me sponsor. You know, that's how I learn. And I have a sponsor. Most of you know who my sponsor is. He spoke here two weeks ago, right? Two weeks ago, Ralph White. I adore that man. I spoke to him today. You know, one of the most amazing human beings I've ever met in my life. When I met him, I went up to him and I said, okay, so this is how this is going to go. And I said, this is going to happen. This is going to happen. And you're going to sponsor me. And then I called him back like a week later. I said, yeah, forget all that. I need you to sponsor me now. I don't know how long ago that was. It was years ago. I was still living in California. I'm so blessed. You know, I'm so blessed for the people who, who care enough about me to be on the other end of the phone. I have never once called that man. And he hasn't answered not once. My sponsors call me, I don't always answer. Not once. No matter what time of day or night it is. And I'm not like one of those crazy people, but the, the one time I called really early was the day my dad passed. You know? Um, anyway, I did this fifth step and I did six and seven. But you know, when your life really changes, wherever you're at in the steps, it doesn't change in one through one through eight. It changes in nine. It changes when you sit down and you look at someone 10 minutes, thanks, baby, I got it. When you sit down and you look at somebody and you say, I harmed you. This is what I did. I never asked anyone to forgive me. What can I do to make it right? And I did that with every single person on my list. I saw, I wrote this fourth step. I graduated from graduate school. My grandfather passed away and I ended up in New Jersey because I didn't have a job um, for three and a half weeks in the summer of 1993, 30 years ago. And I literally spent the three and a half weeks. I don't even know how many amends I made, but I made amends to everybody, everybody in my family. Like I, I found teachers, I found friends, high school, everybody except my mother that my mother it took me another year to make amends to my mother that woman she got on my last nerve and um, I wanted children really badly because of my mother you know my story for anyone who's heard it I I never had children I had 15 miscarriages over the course of 20 years really sad really sad and, and there are days that I'm still sad about it. Most of the time I'm great. God has filled my life up with nieces and nephews and sponsees and their kids and their grandkids, like so many people, like God like puts people in my life 
a million, a million times over, but sometimes it's really hard. It's really sad. It was really hard for me on Passover. You know, sometimes it's really hard to go into, I live in a religious world, to go into like religious settings and be the only one without a baby. It's hard. Or a grandbaby. Um, and I don't feel sorry for myself. I just say it's hard and thank you God for what you've given me and I go, you know, and I'm vain. Thank you God. <laughs> my body's still good at 59. I mean, like, whatever, like, I'll take it wherever I can get it. You know, I finally made amends to my mother in 1994. And it was the hardest amends I ever had to do. Five years later, guys, five years, she looks at me, I'm visiting, I was working on cruise ships, I lived all over the world. I'm multilingual, I speak in other countries, I sponsor people. I was visiting, I was working on cruise ships, I was visiting, I was there for three weeks. The night before I'm leaving, we were sitting there, we were folding laundry, June 2nd, 1999. And my mother just casually goes, I, I, don't even, I don't know if she had a drink in her hands or not even, but she said, you know, I just can't do this my way anymore, sweetheart. Can you tell me what you do? She's talking to me? And we went to a meeting. My mother's permanent date of recovery is June 3rd, 1999. She was struck. She had her big bang theory. I see you, Chris. I love you, girlfriend. I love you, sweetheart. And um. Yeah. And my mom's going to have 24 years on the 3rd of June. And she's 82. And I moved here three weeks after my father passed away. And she was really devastated. He had died um, a long drawn out death with, you know, long drawn out death with um, Alzheimer's and kidney disease. And I was, I had bought my house Chris, Chris is one of my sponsee sisters. They all had heard about the whole house thing. You know, I bought a house that one fell through. I bought another house and I bought this house and I was moving and I was moving and I was really hoping to get there. My dad was sick and then he left this world three weeks before and it was such a gift because so many beautiful miracles happened as a result. I got to say goodbye to people in the middle of the pandemic. People came to pay sh uh, Shiva calls to me that I never would have gotten to see. The many, many beautiful things and I got here and my mom I hadn't seen her in a year because of the pandemic was like this. She was old, she was shriveled, she was really skinny. She was walking with a cane. And I was like, oh my God. My mother is going with me to my home group tomorrow. She still walks with a cane, but not so much. She put on a little weight. She's still really skinny. Don't get me started. Jeans, what, what can I say? Um, but she's still really skinny. She's absolutely adorable. And um and she's happy. And I, I go over there a lot and I help her and I'll do anything for her. And I hated this woman 30 years ago. I hated her. And that doesn't mean it's always good. And that doesn't mean it's always perfect. And that doesn't mean that we always get along. And that doesn't mean that I don't say stuff, but it's an absolute miracle. Because you see, if I don't give up five minutes before the miracle happens, things can happen in my life that I never would have even wanted, planned, or believed. And I don't get it. I don't get it. But what I do know is I'm gonna I'm gonna end in like like a couple of minutes. I'm beginning to end now. I'm gonna start to wind down. I have like three minutes, so I'm gonna start to wind down. There's a line in the doctor's opinion that says they believe in themselves and even more powerful, they believe in the power of the post-chronic alcoholics back from the gates of death. And then there's another line in the big book that says when sex is all the more troublesome, we throw ourselves harder into working with others. But I've changed that to be when life is all the more troublesome, we throw ourselves harder into working with others because I don't want to think that like I sponsor so many people because I'm absolutely incapable. I got five, take my time. Thanks, baby. Because I'm absolutely incapable of having any sort of relationship that goes to a deeper level of intimacy. I don't know if I am or not. But I am talking to somebody and it's kind of fun and kind of exciting. And, and that's, that's also fun. That's also nice. Um, I have been able to do things that I never even thought were possible or wanted to do. I've been in the same job for eight and a half years. We were all laid off. I was laid off from that job in October. And they told me that the day of separation from the company was November 8th. 2022. My father had passed away November 8th, 2020. And the minute they said November 8th, I knew that I wasn't losing my job. And in fact, I interviewed for and got a different position, a higher position, a better job, a better pay. Go figure. That was my dad. I was married to my second husband for, I think, eight or nine years. He was the love of my life. Really difficult relationship. We split up. And then he came back into my life. 
and he was really sick, but he wasn't like cancer sick. He was just like confused sick. He had like early onset dementia. He was 60. He turned 61. I took care of him for the last year of his life and he unexpectedly passed away. I got that phone call. Roby, we're sorry. I'll never forget that phone call. 10.40 a.m., August 2nd, 2016. I thought I was going to die at that moment. When I had had my last miscarriage in 2009, I was done with God. And when Alex left this world in 2016, I couldn't hold on to God hard enough or close enough. And eight or nine or 10 people that I sponsored in the area came and sat with me with his body while we figured out the details. I somehow ended up getting a mortgage and buying a house it still absolutely amazes me. Even with the difficulties, I have a good relationships with my sisters and I pay my nieces and nephews a lot of money to call me Aunt Roby the Fabulous. Everyone has iPhones. <laughs> or actually, ever since I bought a house, I can't do that. And um, I don't try and I don't try and do anything but live my life forward. And I have other things in my life besides Alcoholics Anonymous. I do a conversational Hebrew class. I'm in a writing group. I'm really involved with my job. I'm really involved with my mother and her life. I, I sometimes don't understand. I looked into a graduate program the other day. I actually don't know who I think I am or how all of this stuff is going to work out, but I just kind of follow my heart and follow my instincts and trust, trust that power that I call God. I have a tattooed on my back in Hebrew. I have to hide it because I come from a religious world, but I have the word ruach tattooed on my back and ruach means wind and ruach means spirit because you can't see the wind, but it's really wicked powerful. I'm going to end with this. I'm going to end with reading one of my favorite um, paragraphs in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous that I read at a lot of meetings. And I read it because it's one of my favorite. And I read it because it's true. I read it because it's true. It's from the story, He Who Loses His Life in the third edition on page 542. And it says, for me, AA is a synthesis of all the philosophy I've ever read, all of the positive good philosophy all of it based on love. I've seen there is only one law, the law of love, and there are only two sins. The first is to interfere with the growth of another human being. And the second is to interfere with one's own growth. Never in my life to this day, nor do I believe ever moving forward, will I ever find the love and acceptance that I continue to find in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. And the only thing that's ever asked of me is to give it back. And I am so grateful that God has healed me to the point in my life where I have the capacity to truly, truly, truly love. Thank you very much.